Good morning. Welcome. My name is Joseph Helligy, and I'm the Executive Vice President and Provost at Loyola Marymount University. I'm now pleased to introduce Robert Caro of the Society of Jesus to deliver the invocation. Good and gracious God, on this formal occasion, we are pleased to acknowledge your presence among us and to ask your blessing on all here present as we gather to honor Ban Gi Moon. Like President Obama, Mr. Bon is the, in the final year of his second term and will step down as the eighth Secretary General of the United Nations on December 31st, 2016. It is therefore fitting that we should honor him today. We recognize and celebrate Mr. Bond's visionary leadership in facing such global challenges as climate change, economic upheaval, pandemics, and increasing pressures involving food, energy, and water. And we give thanks to God for Mr. Bond's efforts to be a bridge builder, to give voice to the world's poorest and most vulnerable people, and to strengthen the United Nations itself in the spirit of its 70-year-old charter to be an instrument of peace in the world. Blessed are the peacemakers, we read in St. Matthew's Gospel, for they shall be called sons of God. This is a fitting accolade for Mr. Bond, and we pray God to grant that his vision of an equitable share of the Earth's precious resources <clears throat> for all God's daughters and sons will be among his lasting legacies to the cause of world peace. Finally, dear God, we ask you to bless Mr. Bond with good health and good humor during his final months of service at the United Nations. Afterwards, may he enjoy many years of productive retirement in the company of his devoted wife and their loving family. Amen. Thank you, Father Caro. 
I'm pleased to recognize Chair Aikenhead and LMU trustees, President Snyder, Secretary General Bond, and Mrs. Bond, the United Nations delegation, Representative Waters and her spouse, former Ambassador Williams, and other elected officials and representatives, members of LMU's religious communities, LMU leadership, faculty, staff, alumni and students, and other distinguished guests. Thank you for being with us this morning, and thank you for your support of Loyola Marymount University. We're honored by your presence, and we're happy that you're joining us for today's celebration. This is a special occasion as we present Secretary General Bond with an honorary degree. I'm now pleased to introduce Congresswoman Maxine Waters, our U.S. Representative for California's 43rd Congressional District, to share some opening remarks. Thank you, and good morning. I'd like to thank you very much for that kind introduction. And I want to thank President Snyder and all of my friends here at Loyola Marymount University for inviting me here today to join you in honoring Secretary General Ban Ki-moon and to celebrate his accomplishments and the positive impact he has had on our global community. The Secretary General has worked tirelessly to create an agenda of international cooperation that has at its center the pursuit of public purpose. His leadership on the world stage has given voice to the cause of human rights, to the primary importance of gender equality, to the tragic plight of refugees, and countless other areas of urgent human need. The Secretary General and I share the same goal of helping our most vulnerable populations, whether it is finding shelter for the homeless right here in Los Angeles or a safe haven for the world's refugees. We cannot sit idly by as injustices take hold in our communities and around the world. I'm so impressed by Secretary General's creation of a special agency, UN Women, devoted to the unique challenges that women face. I'm also pleased that under his leadership, the UN itself has increased opportunities for women in management positions. I've been pushing for the same important diversity standards in our own federal agencies in the US. Every generation faces daunting challenges that often appear insurmountable but it's leaders, like the Secretary General, who give us hope that if we work together, we can make this world a better place. In fact, I believe one of our biggest challenges today is indifference and the ease with which so many of us can slip into our comfortable lives and pretend that awareness itself is a virtue. But we must work hard to stay vigilant and constantly keep up the fight. We need to support and follow the leadership of Secretary General Ban Ki-moon and others like him who are not satisfied with the status quo and who have made it their life's work to change our world for better. So I'm proud to be here today to celebrate the ongoing legacy of the Secretary General. And I applaud the university for conferring this honorary degree so that generations of future leaders in Los Angeles and around the world can understand the importance of service to others and helping those in need. Thank you. Thank you, Congresswoman Waters. I now invite Kathleen Hannon Aikenhead, Chair of LMU's Board of Trustees, to deliver the citation. Loyola Marymount University bestows honorary degrees on persons who symbolize in an outstanding manner 
those values it cherishes as an academic community. In honoring these persons, the university acknowledges that the life and work of an honoree also mirror the goals towards which all of us engaged in the search for the authentic meaning of human life strive. Today, the university is proud to honor Secretary General of the United Nations, Pan Ki-moon, as individ an individual whose life achievements very much reflect the mission of the university. Timothy Law Snyder, president of Loyola Marymount University, will introduce the recipient of the honorary degree. I think the program says conferral of degree and remarks, and we're going to do that in the opposite order, just so we can let the suspense rise further. I am honored to join Chair Aikenhead, Representative Waters, and Provost Heligi in welcoming Secretary General Ban Ki-moon to Loyola Marymount University, also known as LMU. Father Caro, thank you for reminding us of the sacred trust we place in our peacemakers, as you aptly quoted from the Gospel of St. Matthew. And Representative Waters, thank you once again for standing with LMU with your incredible strength and your undeniable speed of delivery. I will never match that. <laughs> I was joking earlier today, every time we get together, it's a glorious event. So we have to do something bad at some point just to balance things out so we can get together and find out the other sides of our, of our spirits and souls. We also welcome Mrs. Pond, whom uh, Professor Plate refers to as the first lady of the world, Yusun Tech. We welcome you to LMU. Thank you for being with us. We welcome our UN delegation, our elected officials, representatives, LMU trustees are here, members of our Board of Regents are here, leadership are here, faculty are here, student development administrators, staff, and how many students? Raise your hand. Look at you. Welcome. In no way could our celebration today happen without our co-sponsors whose commitment to LMU's global imagination significantly enhances our international outreach and our engagement efforts. And those parties are the Bellarmine College of Liberal Arts, led by Dean Robin Crabtree. <laughs> and LMU's Asia Media International, led by Professor Tom Plate. And I should also mention we are led by the leader of our Global Policy Institute, Professor Michael Genovese. I'm privileged today to celebrate our honoree, a distinguished world leader and a lifelong statesman and diplomat. Ban Ki-moon is the eighth Secretary General of the United Nations, assuming his post in January 2007. In 2011, Mr. Pond was reconfirmed to a second term, and this is something every department chair, dean, VP, whoever, is just dying for. He was reaffirmed by unanimous acclamation vote at the United States General Assembly. That, that says a lot. Prior to his election, as Secretary General, Mr. Pan served as South Korea's Minister of Foreign Affairs and Trade. He did that for 37 years, and his ministry included postings in New Delhi, Washington, D.C., and Vienna. His diplomatic service included various responsibilities, including National Foreign Policy Advisor to the President, Chief National Security Advisor to the President, Deputy Minister for Policy Planning, and Director General for American Affairs. Mr. Pond's ties to the United Nations date all the way back to 1975, and that was when he worked for the Foreign Ministry's United Nations Division. His work expanded, as you may have noticed, over the years, 
with assignments that included service as chairman of the Preparatory Commission for the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty Organization and chef de cabinet during the Republic of Korea's 2001-2002 presidency of the UN General Assembly. Mr. Pan has also been actively involved in issues related to inter-Korean relations. Mr. Pan's educational background includes a bachelor's degree in international relations from Seoul National University in 1970. He told me earlier about why and how he pursued a liberal arts and sciences pathway, and that's one that's quite akin with LMU's core curriculum. In 1984, he earned a master's degree in public administration from Kennedy School of Government at Harvard University. And he and Mrs. Pond married in 1971. So that's a, you're going on a pretty good anniversary there then. We're, <laughs> we're proud of that. They have one son, two daughters, and four grandchildren, all four of whom plan to come to Loyola Marymount <laughs> University. As Secretary General of the United Nations, Mr. Pan has advanced numerous issues, benefiting millions of persons globally. Highlights include his sustained advocacy on climate change, and that culminated in the Paris Agreement of 2015, no easy task. His support for women's empowerment, where he led by example, and appointed more women to senior positions at the United Nations than ever before. His advancement of international LGBT rights and equality, his commitment to human rights causes, including the Human Rights Upfront Initiative, and through his public visits to regions historically and symbolically linked to human rights abuses, such as Auschwitz, Cambodia, and Rwanda, and their memorials. His efforts to revitalize international disarmament agendas he was the first Secretary General to attend a Hiroshima memorial ceremony. And he's also the first Secretary General of the social media era and has embraced digital communications platforms through his use of Facebook town halls, Google Hangouts, and his LinkedIn presence. I'm going to try to link with him later today. We'll see how fast he responds. <laughs> and students, I got the selfie. <laughs> In addition to the aforementioned areas of focus, we note that Mr. Pond has been a significant force on the world stage by supporting humanitarian efforts in Darfur, Haiti, and Myanmar, in promoting a peaceful dialogue in the Middle East, and in confronting terrorism and extremism. Mr. Pond has been engaged in addressing the Syrian refugee crisis. Now, you may not know when Mr. Pond was elected Secretary General, he showed up at the UN, turned to his UN colleagues, and began to sing, Ban Ki-moon is coming to town. <laughs> you think I made that up? He really did it. <laughs> and he's going to give us a second rendition of that during his remarks today. As a teen, Secretary General Pond was part of the Red Cross sponsored trip to the US, and there he met President John F. Kennedy, which motivated him to take up a career in public service and foreign relations. And this is a good example of how our education for leadership can catch fire in ways exponential. How could JFK have known that those remarks on the South Lawn would create a leader of the superior human kindness and quality, as is our Secretary General. That's just a remarkable moment for us to reflect on. Secretary General Pond's career, approach, and commitment to all these causes, and, and, and many others, have provided evidence of his symbiosis with our mission here at LMU. He tirelessly advocates for those who do not have a voice, and he encourages global community to stand in solidarity with the poorest and most compromised members of our human family. And that would include those recently compromised members of the LMU immigrant and undocumented family. 
Secretary General Pond is not just in sync with our Jesuit and our Marymount values, but also those of the Sisters of St. Joseph of Orange, because he's ultimately all about peace, all about reconciliation. So I, and I think each of us, are honored to confer upon our globally imaginative Secretary General, Mr. Pond, an honorary degree, and we do it in recognition of our community's symbiosis with his spirit, his lifelong commitment to service, and the values and aspirations that we so much cherish. So now comes the best part. Always is it, this I get the I get tingly here, Mr. Pond, please. By virtue of the authority vested in me by the laws of the state of California and by the trustees of Loyola Marymount University, I now confer on Secretary General Pan Gimun the degree of Doctor of Humane Letters, honoris causa, with all the rights, privileges, and responsibilities pertaining to that, to that degree. Congratulations, Dr. Pan. In 2012, Professor Tom Plate, LMU's Distinguished Scholar of Asia and Pacific Studies, authored Conversations with Ban Ki-moon, What the United Nations is Really Like, The View from the Top. The book, part of Professor Plate's Giants of Asia series, was widely acclaimed for its unprecedented and revealing dialogue with Secretary Ban Ki-moon. Last year, Professor Plate's professional and personal rapport with Dr. Bond provided an opportunity to connect the UN and LMU, culminating in a congratulatory video from the Secretary General at President Snyder's inauguration. I'm pleased to introduce Professor Plate, who literally wrote the book <laughs> on the Secretary General, to share his remarks before we hear from Dr. Bond. Thank you, Mr. Provost and uh, our president, Madam Board of Trustees, uh, for the honor of allowing me to introduce our special guest. Uh, I just want to preface uh, my brief remarks by indicating that although Pun Ki Moon is an extremely serious that person is also very funny and witty and uh, very warm. The people who know him never forget him. But we've got to go back to the serious part. He's a deeply serious person. And uh, I, won't, I don't want to trivialize this occasion by telling a few jokes, because he's uh, a serious person who does serious work. So what I have worked up for you is very serious, if you'll, <laughs> if you'll, kind of, if you'll just go with it, all right? <laughs> Now, here, here's how it goes. He walks amid history. He walks amidst history. The failed state, the emergency intervention, the piled up bodies of ethnic cleansing on the side of the road, of genocide, of starvation, the flood. This is the history of now and of again and of again. He walks amid enemies as well as allies the immorally craven dictator, the stubborn premier, and then to the difficult, ever quarrelsome Security Council. 
Not to forget the raucous General Assembly, 194 members strong. He walks amid enemies and admits friends, but it's not always possible to tell the difference between them. But nevertheless, he keeps on walking. Sometimes alone, always relentless, every day a new possibility, a new problem, a new complexity. And a new accusation as another new mess in the works, a blown assignment at the UN, right? It's all entirely the fault of the man who walks amid history. Blame it on the Secretary General. Why not? Who else have we got? He stalks the corridors of the UN, Secretary in New York, every floor a different mission, a different complexity, another hard puzzle, different history, sometimes the history going back half a century or more. But relentlessly, relentlessly he walks. Make it a little better. Don't despair. Keep your own personal hope alive. Reassure your suffering colleagues and your team. We can make a difference. You know it. I believe it. Don't give up. He walks amid history, a history of success, a history of failure. The United Nations disappoints, has disappointed, will always disappoint. It has not grown into what some probably foolishly had dreamed. All too well, in fact, it rather dramatically reflects the sad realities of our times. But the UN is what we have to work with. It is all we have to work with. And so we shall work with it. Work. Work. The man who walks with history likes to work. He does not like to rest. His wife, Suntek, knows. And she knows a lot. She has walked alongside this man who walks with history. She has heard the sighs, felt his pride, felt his hurt, his triumphs. She has shared that history while praying always for peace. But peace not just for the world, but peace for her husband, Hun Ki-moon. He is important too, don't you think? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, here at LMU right now is that man who walks with history, who has made history, and will now allow us at LMU to observe, to observe a little bit of history as he reflects for us about what today, this day in history, is on his mind. History, as you see, just keeps on happening. Ladies and gentlemen, the Secretary General of the United States, Fun ki -moon. Please take, please take a seat. Thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat> Professor Timothy Law Schneider, uh, President of Loyola Mount, Marymount University, Honorable Congresswoman Maxine Walters, Waters of uh, California, uh, Professor Catherine Eichenhead, Chair of the Board of Trustees, Professor Joseph Helligen, Executive Vice Pro President and Provost, Professor Tom Plate, Distinguished Scholar of Asian and Pacific Studies, Professor Elizabeth Drummond, President of the Faculty Senate, Professor Robert V. Caro, SJ, Vice President of Mission and Ministry, uh, Distinguished Faculty Members, United Nations, colleagues, and most importantly, uh, dear young students. Uh, thank you so much for your warm welcome. I am deeply honored to receive this honorary degree, doctoral degree on human, uh, human, what do you say? <laughs> uh, human letters. <laughs> I still to have uh, study more. Yeah. <laughs> this uh, this is the first time I have received uh, quite a number of uh, 
honorary degrees. Normally, it is uh, political science, uh, law degrees. My human letters is the first time that I'm receiving this one. That's why I'm a little bit confused. <laughs> Uh, first of all, I'd like to really thank you for this honor. I know that uh, you recognize my contribution as the Secretary General of the United Nations and so many UN staff at the same time who are working day in, day out for world peace and harmony, human, humanitarian assistance and human rights. I am deeply honored to serve uh, this great organization, uh, which is founded 71 years ago for hu humanity. And I really thank you very much for this recognition, and thank you for this vote of confidence and support for our efforts to advance peace, development, and human rights across the world. I thank my good friend, uh, Professor Tom Plate, uh, for his kind introduction. In fact, the Congresswoman Waters and the President Snyder, they all have spoken very good and nice about me, which is more than what I am, I believe. But I really appreciate that they are very kind words. But by introducing about me, they have spoken out all already what the United Nations has been doing and will have to do and what I was going to uh, tell you, so in a sense, uh, they have uh, preempted what uh, I wanted to say. So if uh, you are patient enough for my one hour long <laughs> statement, or you will just uh, take note of what they said, and uh, just to save me from uh, standing uh, before you. In any way, I really appreciate uh, your kind recognition uh, of my strong commitment as a Secretary General. In fact, if I may want to say something about uh, my relationship with this university, which started from Tom Plate, Professor Tom Plate. It goes back uh, several decades ago when I was working as a Korean government official diplomat, and he was a journalist in the uh, Los Angeles Times covering and measuring in Asia Pacific matters. Korea was not the peaceful or harmonious society at that time was uh, politically turbulent. Uh, we were criticized about the human rights and democracy, and we had to defend, defend what we were doing at that time as a government officials. Of course, he was uh, critical about what the South Korean government was doing on the military, uh, military authoritative uh, regime at that time. Our friendship began from difference of opinions, but the mutual understanding. I tried to understand better what our position was and why he was speaking out all the time, so why he was trying to uh, criticize us. This is what I am doing as a Secretary General now. A lot of people, a lot of leaders I, whom I meet, I have to be very critical that please, Mr. President, Prime Minister, Foreign Minister, you have a problem. We want to see your country uphold democratic principles. Oh, they say, you don't understand our situations. You know, we have this and that, the problems and situation. Mr. Minister, I used to defend my country's position exactly what you have, you are now telling me. Later, after having become Secretary General, I, I'm just, uh, regretting that I was wrong. I was uh, defending my country, my government, only to defend my government. As a Secretary General, I'm telling you, this is what you have to uh, change. From that uh, relationship, I think uh, we have been able to build up uh, more understanding, and I will continue uh, to this. I may have to continue, unfortunately, until the end of my term. That's what I really want to really appreciate your university's recognition of my role and the United Nations role. United Nations will continue. This country, this world is not the peaceful 
This world may be full of perils and challenges, but still, I believe that we are moving toward the right direction, right direction. We have made a great stride, a lot of advances in upholding and saving human lives. Otherwise, much, much more people might have been killed. Otherwise, much, much more women would have, been, would have died while delivering new lives Otherwise, so many people might have been uh, killed or out of uh, schools or died uh, from preventable diseases. And this is what the United Nations is doing. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we are very much grateful for Loyola Marymount's spirit of civic engagement. That's uh, very visible in many ways. The long-standing Decolores program evolved from constructing houses in Mexico to a partnership where you learn from and support each other. You have gone from building homes to building partnership and building bridges between the peoples. This is just what we need at a time when extremist groups and too many politicians strive to divide. We have a good politicians, but there are some politicians who, with some very narrow uh, personal or party interest, they make all divisions and so seed of hatred and division that we have to guard against. I commend the LMU alumna who founded the Press Institute for Women in the developing world which is offering training in Afghanistan, Myanmar, Nepal, Rwanda, and elsewhere. Professor Yok Madut Yok has been doing admirable work to advance education in South Sudan. I welcome Royola's duly established World Policy Institute. Professor Tom Plate's Asian Media Center is another important forum. And you have taken an important stand for human rights by joining other Jesuit colleges and universities in speaking out against racial inequality. Dear students, faculty members, ladies and gentlemen, President Schneider spoke at his inauguration ceremony last year about the importance of global imagination in illuminating pathways into our future. My own global imagination was profoundly influenced by the organization I now serve and lead. You could say, I am a child of the United Nations. When I was just six years old, Korean War break out, broke out in 1950. My parents and we had to flee somewhere. I was one of what we call now eternally displaced persons. I didn't move far away as Syrian refugees or Afghanistan refugees had to travel. It was just within South Korea, but it was same, same experience, same sufferings. At that time, we didn't have anything to eat, nothing to wear, no, no schools. All the schools were destroyed. I saw my village were burning. Everybody was poor. And a lot of people, three million people were killed in just a three year war, Korean War. That was one of the most terrible wars in human history. At that time, United Nations came. They provided everything which we needed, food, clothing, water, milk, or even textbooks. The UNESCO, UNICEF, all United Nations, they came to support us. And I was one of the beneficiaries of United Nations. More importantly, 
21 UN member states joined this sort of a coalition forces. The United Nations Command was established under the commandership of the United States. The United States was leading this military operation to, uh, uh, to repel North Korean attack, at aggression. At that time, United Nations blue flag was lifeline for Koreans, and they saved us, rescued us from all this aggression, poverty, and disease, and everything. I am very much honored and humbled, even now, 17, year, 17 years later, after. There are so many countries, so many people, who still see United Nations flag as their beacon of hope. That whenever I saw, when I saw them, I was very much moved, motivated, as just as United Nations was with me at the time, and then I, I, I've been telling them that, look, United Nations is, is with you. I was you, but you are now with me, United Nations. That's what I've been trying to give sense of hope and give some sense of resilience uh, to uh, many people around the world. Now, as a Secretary General of the United Nations, I strive daily to do for others what the United Nations did for me in 60, more than 60 years ago. Over the past 10 years, I have sought to empower world's women, defend the human rights, strengthen peace operations, promote social justice, and modernize the United Nations. I thank you for recognition. It was I who established for the first time UN Women, the super agency to promote, empower women in the United Nations. Around the world, there are not many countries where Ministry of Women or Gender Empowerment, few countries they have. United Nations, there was nothing like that. So I thought that we need to have this sort of a Ministry of Women. Uh, we don't call it Ministry, the UN Women. This is a super agency uh, to deal with United Nations, not only United Nations, but women all around the world. <laughs> now, ladies and gentlemen, as I said, uh, the world seems to be full of problems, conflicts. But still, world leaders, they have shown their vision and providing some good vision and promise and hope. This is what we call 2030 develop, Development Agenda, Sustainable Development Agenda, targeting by 2030, 15 years later, after, that we should make sure that there is no abject poverty in this world. There should, there should be 50-50 planet Earth where men and women will be equal in every aspect of our life. There should be no people, no person who would be dying from preventable diseases. There should be no children, school-aged children, who would be out of school. So these are very ambitious broad, far-reaching vision, which world leaders have adopted September last year. Another important thing, seemingly almost impossible negotiations, which have been there during the last 30 years, we were able to adopt the Paris Agreement on Climate Change. This is a very ambitious again, to save this planet Earth, the only planet Earth we have for a sustainable way. If uh, we see the people, the way people consume, the way people operate in the economies and social life, it seems to me that people seem to believe we have two planet Earth, but unfortunately we have only one. This is the only place where us and our succeeding generations will have to live as long as 
this planet Earth exists, and we will have to live. We have started very good beginning. Paris Agreement maybe is not all, it's not the end, final destination. It's just the beginning, but very significant turning point, turning point in our efforts to renew our commitment, world leaders, uh, to work for this sustainable Earth. These agreements open exciting new horizons. Yet our hopes are threatened by still armed conflict, terrorism, extremism, and brutal acts that defy all norms of humanity. More people have fled their homes than any time. There are 60 million people, refugees, and internally displaced persons. 60 million, that's the most number since the end of Second World War. I think uh, in uh, human history, during millennia years, the most terrible, horrible things was sec Second World War, where 60 million people were killed in just a five-year war. And much more people became refugees and they lost their homes. But now, unfortunately, we are seeing that kind of uh, situation. 125 million people need daily assistance from the United Nations. United Nations now, including 60 million, altogether 125 million people, we have to provide daily food, water, sanitation, schools. This is a huge, enormous burden. Unfortunately, we are very seriously uh, suffering from lack of funding uh, from the countries. United, Nation, United States used to be and still continues to be the most generous country. But United, Nation, United States cannot do it alone, however resourceful US may be. That's the problem. That's why I'm going to convene, for the first time in the history of the United Nations, the World Humanitarian Summit meeting next month in Istanbul. I'm asking world leaders to come to Istanbul with their strong political commitment. How United Nations can deliver the expectations of the people and the daily needs of so many people. Now, the nightmare in Syria has just entered its sixth, sixth year. The United Nations is leading diplomatic efforts to end the conflict. My special envoy on Syria, you must have heard his name, Stefan Demistra, is still working very hard. Uh, he's now in uh, traveling uh, Moscow. We are going to op resume the meeting next week where we are going to bring all the Syrian parties so that we will be able to uh, have a political solution because they have been fighting during the last six years, they, their positions are far apart. And with all this uh, diplomatic creativity and skills, we've been trying to uh, extract some common elements, commonalities as much as possible. We are really trying to expand the political space where we can have some room for discussions. This is what we are doing. And we've been trying to provide humanitarian assistance to um, hundreds of thousands of people. At least by the end of this month, we will have to deliver to one million people who are not reachable because of their own uh, security concerns. The United Nations and our partners, including the United States, are managing to finally get some humanitarian supplies uh, through, but there are still people in besieged areas. I'm very moved by your decision, taken just a days ago, to help Syrian students and scholars uh, who have been torn from their homes and schools. I thank uh, President Schneider for your initiative. Syrian refugees want to go home. They want to study, but they cannot. I have been pressing all countries to resettle Syrians 
and refugees of so many other nationalities who have a right to asylum. Yet too many countries are erecting barriers above the wires or not doing their fair share. And I have been urging world leaders, please show your compassionate leadership. Instead of erecting walls, that's not good, that's morally wrong and strategically incorrect one. With um, little support, refugees will become doctors, caregivers, workers, entrepreneurs, professors, bright students and researchers who advance a human uh, progress for all. I thank you for recognizing that these refugees are an asset to your community. Ladies and gentlemen, let me say a special word to our young students who are present here today. You are part of the largest generation of young people the world has ever known. The half of the global population are under the age of 25. This world is still very young, even though we have a four, four billion year history. The world in terms of demography wise, very young. It's important to provide social, economic, and fair opportunities. Decent opportunities for young people, including quality education. You are also part of one of the most important ways that the United Nations has changed to keep up with the times. We are focusing on the power of young people as never before. When I look around this room, I see more than leaders of the future. I see the leaders already for today. So I'm asking to think the professors, teach them well, and make sure that they become the leaders of today, immediately, by having decent opportunities, job opportunities. Too often, sometimes young people are regarded some problems, a source of problems. They sometimes become easy prey for terrorists, extremists. But where some see trouble, I see an underutilized potentials and underutilized powerhouse for human progress. That is why I appointed, again for the first time in the United Nations, youth envoy of the Secretary General. He is a very young man, now just a 31 year old, but he's trying to liaise and making networks with youth groups around the world. Last December, the Security Council has adopted a landmark resolution about the youth, peace, and security. 11 years ago, the Security Council recognized that women issue should be a very important issue for world peace and security. They adopted landmark resolution 11 years ago. You, you might have heard Security Council Resolution 1325. This is a sort of very important Security Council numbers. You should remember 1325. This is a landmark resolution because Security Council for the first time recognized that this as a women issue has a direct implications to international peace and security. Before that, they have not recognized it. Now, the Security Council last December recognized young people, youth issue is implicated, has a great implication for world peace and security, 2250. This is one of landmark resolution. That much, United Nations is very much committed to work for and work with women and young people. Young people today have a wide ranging opportunities to contribute, to link up with like-minded peers, and to pursue 
their dreams, their visions. Whatever path you may choose, the world needs you to show allegiance, not just to your immediate community or nation, but to the wider global community. I'm asking young students to have a global citizenship. Just the studying and living in this uh, most affluent society like the United States, you may have to lose a sight for other people. Try to have a compassion. It's a prerogative for young people to have a passion. Everybody has a passion. But not many, not all the people have compassion for others. How other people are doing outside of the United, United States. Just look beyond your national boundaries. And it's important to have a global vision with a global uh, citizenship. LMU is a place to learn, to question, and to challenge. Universities need to be places where we can listen to each other and each other's ideas in peace. This hilltop campus gives you a beautiful view of a Pacific Ocean. But I know you also look within and in keeping with the Jesuit nature of this school. I saw that character up close last September when His Holiness of Pope Francis came to the United Nations. I recall his moving words on that occasion. I quote, the full meaning of individual and collective life, he said, is found in selfless service to others and in, in the sage and respectful use of creation for the common good, end of quote. I look forward to the contribution you will make as a global citizen. And if you make choice, I made a decade ago, like a becoming a public servant, but it's not necessary you always become public servant. Whatever profession you may choose, do something good for others, other communities and other nations and other people. Let us reach out to the vulnerable and the excluded people. Let us fulfill our duty as a global citizen to leave no one behind. No one should, everybody should get on board. This is the main philosophical theme of 2030 Sustainable Development Agenda, when world leaders committed themselves, their leadership, so that no one will be left behind. And to reach out to the farthest, to the first. Together, ladies and gentlemen, we can usher in an era of dignity for I thank you for this honor and recognition for the United Nations, and I commit myself until the last day of my mandate as Secretary General, we'll work together with you to make this world better for all. I thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Secretary Bond. Uh, I now ask you to return with President Snyder so that he may bestow on you this hood as a symbol of the degree which we have conferred. Thank you again, Secretary Bond, for being with us 
and for sharing your wise words with us. LMU is now proud to call you one of its own. And on behalf of Loyola Marymount University, I thank all of you for joining us in honoring Secretary General Bond. As we conclude this event, I ask you to remain seated during the recessional. Please enjoy the rest of your day.